Welcome to part two of the Ironclads of the Civil War series. If you haven't listened to part one, I strongly encourage you to do so as the episodes do flow in chronological order. In part one, we learned of the South's plan for constructing their first ironclad ship, the CSS Virginia, to take on the Union Navy. Now let's dive into what was going on in the North and familiarize ourselves with the famous inventor that designed the Union's prototype ironclad ship. Let's dive into the story. Hello, and welcome to the Spark History Show, where we bring history to light. Take a dive with us into history and hear the real accounts of the stories of the past as they actually unfolded. Explore with us as we shine some light on the amazing events that shaped our world into what we have today. We are going to recreate the stories of the past to better understand the struggles and triumphs during the most epic moments in history. This is the Spark History Show. Let us begin the journey. What was the Union Navy doing while the Confederates hastily constructed a new superweapon for the Civil War? Well, naturally, they were working as fast as they could on their own version of an ironclad warship that could prevent the Confederates from gaining an advantage in this new arms race. The Union had been hard at work reviewing the blueprints of potential ironclad ships in response to the Confederates' naval strategy of building an unsinkable warship. The contract ended up going to an inventor named John Erickson, who had several ship designs and other inventions under his belt. Erickson was actually born in Sweden in 1803 and later immigrated to England and then to the United States. He had started in engineering at an early age and studied with a German engineer officer working on a canal system that was being constructed over the course of seven years. Using his knowledge of drawing for engineering purposes, he later joined the Swedish military and studied artillery and land surveying. He was adept at drawing and was put into a position creating maps of Sweden's vast collection of owned territories. He continued in this field until the age of 24 when trouble with his relationships and an illegitimate son may have pushed him into moving away from his homeland. At 24 years old, Ericsson picked up what he owned and headed for England. Once in England, he was able to join an engineering firm and create several new patents and inventions. Ericsson had a grand idea to replace the steam engine with another device described as a hot air engine, where fumes rather than steam powered the device, but his dream project was put on hold as he had to complete the projects required by his new job with the British engineering firm rather than follow his own vision. During his service with the firm, he worked on coolers and refrigerators for distilleries and upgrades to existing steam engines already in service. It is interesting to note that around this time, Ericsson stumbled into a number of setbacks in his career, but he kept on moving forward, working to build on new ideas and push the envelope of invention. This can be seen time and time again with individuals that go on to make great achievements. In more modern times, Michael Jordan didn't make the cut for his high school basketball team, but ended up becoming one of the greatest basketball players of all time. Steve Jobs was kicked out of the company that he helped start, but later was able to come back and then innovate by leading his company through the launch of the iPod and iPhone that changed the world forever. Ericsson could just have easily called it quits after his setbacks, abandoning his adventurous career path for something more stable and forgiving. But this is not what ambitious individuals do when presented with obstacles. They find a way to overcome. The first full steam engine that 24-year-old Ericsson was able to design was chartered for a ship called the Victory in the year 1827. Unfortunately, the ship's voyage was ill-fated, as the ship ended up sinking in the Arctic as it tried to find a supposed route called the Northwest Passage, which would link the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean by traveling along the northern coast of Canada. Unfortunately, during this period in history, Arctic ice in the freezing cold weather so far north was just too thick to break through, and a Northwest Passage was not a viable option. The blocks of ice presented too strong of an obstacle for a ship. The owners of the vessel blamed Ericsson for the disaster of the sunken victory. Working to refute the claims against his invention, Ericsson shot back, stating that the men that chartered the ship had requested only a war steamer and not an Arctic explorer that would have to break through the ice in the freezing waters of the northern Atlantic. It is hard to make a correct tool for a job when the job it is to be used for remains hidden from the designer. Ericsson continued on and created steam-powered fire engines that he felt were superior to current engine design. The London Fire Brigade, however, thought that the design was too drastic of a change from the previous standard and decided they were not practical enough to use. 
In October of 1829, the Liverpool and Manchester Railroad Company set up a competition to find the best design for a modern locomotive. The front runner of the competition was a locomotive called Rocket, which was designed by the father-son team of George and Robert Stevenson. Another entry was a locomotive dubbed Novelty, which was Ericsson's entry into the competition. Other engines were entered as well, and a three-day race took place to prove which would be the winning design. Crowds of onlookers watched as the newly designed locomotives prepared for the race. The Ericsson Novelty was able to outrun the rocket down a straightaway while unloaded, but the rocket was able to surpass the Ericsson engine, which just couldn't make it up to the full 20 miles per hour that the rocket was able to reach when it was given the full weight of a load-bearing voyage. The Novelty was also constantly taken out of commission due to mechanical failures. Eventually, Ericsson had to remove his engine from the competition due to the mechanical problems. The rocket then proceeded to win the race and the competition. Even though the novelty did not win, it did help to place Ericsson onto the scene of the prominent engineers of the time. During the 10 years that Ericsson operated in England, he was able to develop 30 patents of his own design. Relating to what would come next, he also built a steamship which used a screw propeller instead of the standard paddle wheel design of the time. During his time in England, he gained superb knowledge and skills in engineering, but ran into tough times when the firm that employed him went bankrupt in 1837. England went into a severe recession in 1837, and Ericsson, finding himself in a position without steady work in an engineering firm paying the bills, ended up in a tough spot. In the end, he was forced to declare bankruptcy as his debts exceeded his worth during the troubled times. Ericsson's next journey will take him to the shores of America, where he will continue his engineering career. Ericsson had tested his screw propeller design in England on the Thames River in London. It just so happened that one of the observers of the event was a New Jersey native, Robert F. Stockton. Stockton was heavily invested in building canals and railroads and had ventured to England to raise additional funds to support his canal projects back in New Jersey. Witnessing the Ericsson demonstration on the Thames, Stockton saw the potential in the screw propeller propulsion system. When he witnessed the testings of the Ericsson ship, he ended up purchasing an iron ship of familiar design and had it sent to America to operate in his canals where the iron hull would be able to break through ice patches that would otherwise block off the water transportation network. In November of the year 1839, Ericsson followed the path that his fortunes had taken and took a steamship across the Atlantic to move to New York City in the United States. Now for some of the background on the man of Robert F. Stockton. He had a long career in the U.S. Navy and served during the War of 1812, as well as fought the Barbary Pirates off the coast of Africa. He was also the one who took charge of the land and sea fleet that captured Los Angeles and annexed California to the United States in the Mexican-American War. He quickly saw the innovative design and functionality of the Ericsson-built ships. Believing that steamships were the way of the future, he worked toward and gained an agreement for the United States government to charter the construction of a steam-powered warship of Ericsson's design based on his recommendations of Ericsson's talent. For America, this was the first steam warship powered by a propeller rather than a paddle wheel that was to be built, and decision makers in the U.S. Navy wanted to see firsthand what the new ship design had to offer the Navy. The ship that was constructed was named the Princeton and offered Ericsson a great opportunity to showcase his engineering skills with his new creation for the American Navy. There were two large wrought iron cannons that were built specifically for the ship. One named the Oregon was built in England and shipped to the United States. Due to a dispute between the parties, the second gun was built in the U.S. by the order of Stockton and was named the Peacemaker. The cannon that shipped from England under Ericsson's supervision contained an additional manufacturing process where the breech or rear of the gun was wrapped in a reinforcing band of iron to further protect the barrel due to the large ordnance that would be fired. The American-produced gun, Peacemaker, omitted this type of manufacturing technique. The two 12-inch guns were the largest in the Navy at the time and could launch a 228-pound cannonball, an estimated distance of 5 miles. The 164-foot Princeton was assembled, completed, and outfitted in 1843. To show off the new powerhouse that was constructed for the American Navy, a demonstration cruise was set up on February 28, 1844 in the port of Alexandria, Virginia, near the capital of Washington, D.C. 
a large contingent of delegates and family members came out to board the ship to enjoy the spectacle. The entourage even included the United States President John Tyler. Once the ship was cruising down the Potomac, the U.S. made cannon, the Peacemaker, was prepped to be fired, and two test shots were made. They launched cannonballs out, skipping over the water and out of sight to the awe of onlookers. After the demonstrations, many of the 200 plus people on the ship went below decks to celebrate with a feast. As the feast continued, it was indicated that the passengers wanted to hear the roar of the cannon once more. And while the ship was passing Mount Vernon, which was the home of the first president of the United States, George Washington, it was agreed that the cannon would be fired in salute a third and final time. There was an announcement made at the dinner to announce the salute, and a number of the guests started to head above decks to observe the test fire. President Tyler himself started to head upstairs when he heard his son-in-law singing a patriotic tune, and he paused a moment to take it in. Just as he was standing there waiting for the melody to be completed, a huge explosion shook the entire ship. A thick and deep cloud of white smoke smothered the entire top deck in obscurity after the blast. The powerful cannon, the Peacemaker, had malfunctioned and exploded, throwing smoke, fire, and shrapnel in every direction. People came up from below decks to see what had happened and were shocked at the graphic horror that had unfolded on the deck as the smoke began to clear and provide them with visibility. Coughing and waving away the smoke, onlookers strained their eyes to see, and as the smoke began to clear, they began to witness the bodies thrown away from the cannon from the force of the explosion. Blood splattered all across the deck. Body parts, including arms and legs, were strewn about, separated from their owners' bodies in the blast. Some of the men that didn't lose their limbs were struck with bits of iron from the gun and lay knocked back, bleeding profusely, or left unconscious. Many that were close to the cannon had their eardrums ruptured and were made deaf by the shockwave from the gigantic blast. One of the accounts from the event states that an arm that was blown off of the man Virgil Maxey, who died as a result of the explosion, smacked into the head of a lady on board, and her bonnet, which is a hat tied around her chin, was not clean off of her head. Another woman had her dress splattered with blood from the casualties in front of her, which took the force of the explosion, leaving her unharmed physically, but mentally scarred by the horror. The result of the cannon's malfunction was catastrophic. A number of men from the government, including the Secretary of State and the Secretary of the Navy, were killed in the blast. President Tyler was only spared by his delay in getting to the deck to observe the test firing. Stockton had burns across his face from the gunpowder and much of the hair on his head was completely burned off. Reports claim that Stockton was carried off to his cabin in a state of delirium over what had happened. It was a gruesome event and everyone was left in shock. A later investigation indicated that the resulting explosion was because of, and I quote, faulty construction techniques. The accident was the worst peacetime disaster that the country had faced up until that time. From this point on, the Navy did not order any wrought iron guns, even though the design flaw was only present in the cannon locally sourced, and not the one that Ericsson had guided with the proper construction process overseas. Stockton never tried to defend Ericsson for what had happened on the ship, and Ericsson for the next 10 years didn't have any work from the United States Navy with the negative reputation from the event preventing him from receiving any government contracts. Ericsson continued to work in New York building steam engines and also got to work on his own idea for a hot air or caloric engine. He ended up going on to sell up to a thousand of the caloric engines over the course of the 1850s. Even though he had these numerous setbacks, he continued to work as an engineer and was not deterred by setbacks and instead tried to learn from his mistakes. Although as an inventor, he could directly see the advantage of a new technology, it was sometimes harder for the masses to see the real benefit that can be achieved. The new technology had to be made into a prototype and successfully demonstrated to an audience to overcome the average individual's own resistance to change. This is something that inventors of any time or age run into. It was not just the idea, but the implementation of the idea that was important. A setback such as what happened with the catastrophe on board the Princeton could drastically push back the adoption of new technologies and tarnish an inventor's reputation. When the Civil War started in April of 1861, several enterprising industrialists started lobbying the federal government for contracts to build warships for the Union Navy. The government started to issue contracts to fund the construction of the weapons that would be required to win the war. 
the Federal Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, had worked up a draft bill for the construction of a special ironclad warship. Wells, along with senators backing the idea, ended up being able to pass a bill in Congress to construct an ironclad ship, and the bill was signed by the president on August 2nd. The federal government was now obligated to sift through the private industrial organizations with designs and estimated costs for construction of the warship and find a suitable partner to create the ironclad. The bill appropriated $1.5 million for the construction of the new ship. If you remember correctly, the final design for the Confederate CSS Virginia was finalized on June 25th of 1861, and construction was already underway for the Confederate warship. The Union Navy just cleared the way to appropriate funds for an ironclad ship on August 2nd of the same year, and they didn't even have a set design in place at that time. The Confederates had a bit of a head start. They were already building their new naval weapon when the Union had just made the final decision that they would begin searching for an optimal design for an ironclad. Erickson was able to jump back into the scene for the federal naval contracts after avoiding them for years due to the distaste left from the USS Princeton incident because of a man by the name of Cornelius Bushnell. Bushnell had been working with the Naval Secretary Wells and had his own proposal for an ironclad ship called the Galena, which he believed would meet the government's requirements for an ironclad weapon of war. Bushnell was an industrialist that started out in the railroad industry with the New Haven and New London Railroad Company and had ties to government officials whom he had lobbied regarding matters of the railroad as it expanded. In a couple of years, he had helped turn around the company to become profitable after being near bankruptcy. When the Civil War began, Bushnell was in charge of a shipyard in Connecticut and he was working with a naval constructor, Samuel Pook. He had worked with Pook to establish the design for the Galena, but wanted additional input on the soundness of the design, and so he reached out to the colleague Cornelius Delamater, who ran an ironworks in New York City named Delamater's Ironworks. Delamater's Ironworks was a prestigious firm in New York, which sold the bulk of marine steam engines in the United States at the time. Coming full circle now, Cornelius Delamater had worked with the inventor and designer John Erickson, and the two had done business in the past with boilers and propellers for ships. When Delamater reviewed the plans for the ironclad, he insisted to Bushnell that he should discuss the design with his close colleague, John. This is how Erickson was brought into the picture. Not only did he review the Galena and inform Bushnell that he was not at all impressed with the design, but he also submitted plans for his own type of ironclad ship, which became what we know of today as the Monitor, with its low deck and single mounted turret. Bushnell was so impressed by the Ericsson design that he moved forward to pitch the idea to the government officials using the new Ericsson design instead of focusing on his own Galena blueprint. Bushnell had a tough time pitching the eccentric Ericsson design to the ironclad naval board, which had the final approval on the project. The ship looked drastically different from the standard ship of the day, and many members of the board were extremely skeptical. Here is a famous quote from Captain Charles Henry Davis as he criticized the miniature model of the ship presented to the board. Take the little thing home and worship it, as it would not be idolatry because it was made in the image of nothing in the heaven above, or the earth below, or the waters under the earth. Ouch. I think a simple no vote or an I don't like it would have sufficed. Erickson ended up having to go to Washington himself to help display the soundness of the design and sell the project to the naval board. In the end... The Naval Board agreed to the construction of the ship as an experimental design and stipulated in the contract that it was to be delivered in 100 days for a price of $275,000. The race was now on to build the ironclad warship for the Union Navy that could take on the Confederate vessel which was being produced to destroy the Union's blockade of the South. With the design for the ironclad ship approved, work began on constructing the experimental vessel. The ship that was being produced differed drastically from the traditional wooden ships of the line from earlier time periods. The length of the ship was to be 172 feet and the width was to be 41 feet. But the ship was basically constructed as two different hulls placed one upon the other. The upper hull was essentially an iron raft that offered a flat deck surface just above the waterline which acted as a platform for a central rotating turret built into the middle of the ship. 
The turret enclosure protected the cannons of the warship and offered a high point above the deck to get a nice trajectory for the cannons to launch their projectiles. The hull was shaped in a standard elliptical design, being rectangular in the center and then tapering off into rounded triangular points at the ends. The flat iron deck would also contain a small box pilot house sticking up near the bow where the navigation of the ship could be determined with a clear line of view. The top of the flat deck was only about a foot and a half above the actual water line. This style was completely different from the wooden ships of the past which had decks significantly higher than the water line to manage rough seas. The sides of the deck on a normal ship would be like a wall facing the enemy and have gun ports in them for a broad side of cannons that could attack enemy ships. The second part of the hull is a lower portion consisting of an iron fortified hull that was more traditional in design and would house the majority of the workings of the ship. This part of the ship was less heavily protected as it was entirely below the waterline and was not open to direct fire. The upper and lower holes of the ship were connected by what was called an overhang. This was a pine and oak wood reinforced with iron wrapping around the sides of the raft style top hole of the ship and went down to several feet below the waterline which overlapped the bottom of the hole coming up from below. Looking at images of the two hull parts connecting, it reminds me of the way an aluminum cap on a glass tea bottle tightens around the bottle below it. The top of the cap has a similar flat surface as in the flat ironclad deck and the overhang. Well, the overhang would be the sides of the cap coming over the edges of the top of the glass bottle. The seal is water type and the cap protects the lip of the glass bottle and the contents inside. That is, you know, until you want to quench your thirst. The turret was the main part of the warship. It contained two 11-inch Dahlgren guns and their crews and was fit to battle an enemy ironclad. The turret was a bit cramped inside with the gun crews as it was only 21 feet in diameter and contained a number of men working to maintain the cannons and fire on the enemy. The walls of the turret were decked out with 8 inches of iron plating which extended to 11 inches around the vulnerable gun ports. The circular shape of the turret design would also deflect some of the force of a cannonball similar to how the southern Merrimack would deflect shots with the inclining angle of its outer wall. The entire turret rested on 10 inch in diameter ball bearings which enabled it to be turned by a small steam engine on board the ship, allowing it to fire in any direction required. The rotating turret is now a standard design on all modern naval warships, but on the monitor it was a novelty feature. There were four hatches in the turret that allowed the crew access to the area below decks where all the standard quarters of a ship were housed. The only significant targets presented to the enemy were the heavily fortified turret and the small pilot house in the front of the ship, both of which were significantly above the waterline. Air vents were used to ensure that the men would have sufficient breathable air while enclosed below decks on the ship. The gun ports also had iron shields that would swing down into place to cover the firing hole while the weapons were being reloaded. The cannon themselves were shaped in the same way as a glass soda bottle where the breech or rear of the gun was reinforced with many additional bands or layers of iron, causing it to be much thicker on the back end. This allowed the gun to fire a significantly greater charge without having it explode in the operator's faces. Sounds like a feature that the gun crews didn't mind having. The 11-inch Dahlgren guns were capable of firing a 166-pound cannonball. The idea was instead of having a vast broadside of smaller guns, which was effective primarily against wooden ships, the Union ship would contain a concentrated dose of firepower from the two large cannons, which could generate enough force on impact to penetrate an enemy ironclad ship. Ericsson had set up the designs and drawings of the new ship and followed the entire production of the vessel. His drawings for different parts of the ship were sent out to a number of different companies in the Union to have the parts created as quickly as possible. The North had the significant industrial production centers of the country, and unlike the South, had many options and companies within the New York area to assist with building parts of the ship. On such a diverse production, it was common to have the pieces fit together and then manually update and refit them several times to get the parts to match up exactly. 
It was said that Ericsson's designs were so accurate that even though the parts were made hundreds of miles apart, they were able to fit and snap right together without having to do the significant custom fitting of the objects once they arrived. Work began on the keel of the ship on October 25th, 1861 in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, New York. 175 men toiled away in the naval yard, piecing together the ship as the parts arrived. The ship would be propelled by a 9 foot in diameter screw propeller with four separate blades to give the ship the oomph required to move the iron hulk. Due to the armored deck with limited target points open to the enemy, no method of sail was to be used. There were two separate steam powered boilers that would power the propeller and they were located below decks under and behind the main turret structure in the middle of the ship. The two separate boilers both connected to the one existing drive shaft and under full steam offered a force of 320 horsepower. 320 horsepower. To give you a frame of reference to how far we have come from then in terms of technology, a modern day V6 Chevy Camaro has about 320 horsepower. A modern day naval destroyer has about 100,000 horsepower and can reach speeds of up to 30 knots on open water. The 320 horsepower that Ericsson's design boasted was designed to enable it to reach speeds of up to eight or nine knots, which is what was required in the production contract. The experimental vessel was set to carry up to 100 tons of coal to use as fuel, which enabled a voyage of up to eight days before having to stop and refuel. This new monstrosity of a warship that was being created needed a name. On January 20th of 1862, the Union Naval Secretary reached out to Erickson to determine if he had a favored name for the vessel that was nearing completion. Erickson replied with the following letter. Sir, in accordance with your request, I now submit for your approbation a name for the floating battery at Greenpoint. The impregnable and aggressive character of this structure will admonish the leaders of the Southern Rebellion that the batteries on the banks of their rivers will no longer present barriers to the entrance of the Union forces. The ironclad intruder will thus prove a severe monitor to those leaders. But there are other leaders who will also be startled and admonished by the booming of the guns from the impregnable iron turret. Downing Street will hardly view with indifference this last Yankee notion, this monitor. To the lords of the admiralty, the new craft will be a monitor, suggesting doubts as to the propriety of completing those four steel-clad ships at three and a half million apiece. On these and many similar grounds, I propose to name the new battery Monitor. Your obedient servant, J. Erickson. When we think of the term monitor today, we think of it in terms of keeping an eye on something. Say, for example, a heart rate monitor keeping tabs on a patient's heartbeat. We might think of a monitor as a computer display where our eyes monitor what actions we are performing within the device. When Ericsson was using the term monitor, it could be thought of as a ship that would be monitoring the Navy's rivers and harbors from the rebellious south. At the same time, if you listen closely to his letter, Ericsson's main point strove to convey the impact on perception that his new invention will have. Yes, the vessel would be able to guard the rivers and the harbors, but it would also put fear into the Southern Rebellion and its leaders. It would show the British, which he referenced in stating the Lords of the Admiralty and Downing Street in his letter, that their own ironclad ship designs were underwhelming compared to America's version. The name was accepted and on January 30th of the year 1862, the newly manufactured Monitor launched out of dry dock in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, New York and successfully floated in open water, passing the first test of seaworthiness. Work also continued on the ship after it entered the water. The Union was able to quickly assemble a crew of sailors totaling 57 men as many were eager to volunteer for service on the new superweapon. The original Union contract had requested that the Monitor be completed by January 12th. Although it was launched past that date, it was still a great engineering feat to design and launch a completely new model of warship in such a short time frame of only 118 days. Since time was of the essence and the late launch stressed the situation even more, the Monitor was not able to undergo standard testing and was looking to be sent directly to Hampton Roads and towards the Gosport Navy Yard. 
Hampton Roads is a term for a body of water near Virginia and the surrounding land in southeastern Virginia and northeastern North Carolina, where the local rivers have their outlets to the ocean. The Hampton Roads area connects on the northern side into the Chesapeake Bay, which provides access to six separate states by way of water. Sailing into the Hampton Roads area from the Atlantic Ocean and then up the Elizabeth River into Virginia, the Union ship could reach the Naval Yard in Norfolk, Virginia. The main mission was to destroy the Naval Yard dry dock, preventing the South from constructing more ironclad ships that could take on the Union Navy. On February 19th, the Monitor steamed down the East River of New York City to the close-by Brooklyn Naval Yard. It arrived later than the appointed time as there had been a mistake in setting up the steam cutoff valves on the ship, which limited the Monitor to about only half of its normal speed. Basic tests were able to be performed once the vessel was in the water and officially commissioned as a U.S. Navy ship on February 25th, 1862. The final adjustments were being made on the ship and the vessel was loaded with ammunition and food stores for the journey it was about to undertake. It was quickly discovered that the rudder was not functioning properly when the ship again set sail south down the East River near New York City. The ship would only move in a zigzag fashion and was not able to create forward motion in a straight line. It zigzagged between Brooklyn on one side of the river and then New York on the other. Eventually, the hindrance in the control of the rudder led to the ship smashing into the Riverside business, New York Gas Works, and the ship ground to a full stop. The captain of the ship decided to have the monitor towed back into port to fix the issue, as they were unable to operate with the current status of the rudder. Once Erickson heard of the issue, he devised a plan to have the rudder fixed and fully functional within three days. The final adjustments were made to the ship while at the same time February slowly turned into March. It had been snowing in late February around New York and now around March 3rd the Monitor had to wait for clear seas as there were a series of days with rough swells in the Atlantic that posed a danger to the low decked ship. Finally on March 6th 1862 the Monitor got under steam and started heading south towards Hampton Roads. Two additional steamships accompanied the Monitor, as well as a tugboat that used tow lines to help pull the Monitor. The tow lines, along with the power from the Monitor's own steam engine, enabled the fleet to proceed as fast as possible to the south to confront the Confederates. As the ship embarked on the journey, the crew continued to test, drill, and gain a better understanding of the innovative functions of the revolutionary new ironclad ship. The ship set sail with 14 officers and 49 crewmen. They were on their way to make history. The men of the ship knew they would have a pivotal battle in the war taking on the enemy ironclad. Little did they know the full and lasting effects that their voyage would have on the world. This concludes part two of our Ironclads of the Civil War series. Check out part three of Ironclads to continue the story. If you would like to check out additional episodes or help out the show, please head over to sparkhistory.com. Also, to give a bit more of a visualization of the ships, we also have a few pictures on the site in the show notes to go along with the story. Thank you for listening to the Spark History Show, and have a great day.